Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Bill Riley, and on behalf of all of us here at Medical Advantage, welcome to our session. Thank you for joining us. A market update on behavioral health. Uh, we're going to cover a broad range of uh, topics here today, a, a just general market update, uh, trends related to COVID, um, um, and, and how that impacts uh, clinical services, uh, the, the impact on merger and acquisition activity, and I think accelerating some, some things we had begun to see in the private equity space, all of that uh, and, and how that impacts data um, and, and our, our use of technology. Uh, really, this session is just an opportunity to share some of the things that we've been seeing in the last year to, to 18 months in the behavioral health space. Let me do a quick uh, housekeeping update. All of the phone lines are currently muted. Uh, you can uh, submit questions. We are going to pause a little bit later in the session and take some questions. So please use the little uh, bubble in your GoToWebinar control panel and we'll get to as many as, as we can. It is my pleasure to introduce our panelists today. Let me start with uh, Angie. Uh, any of you who've uh, attended any number of past webinars um, yeah, probably have seen Angie at a one, one, one of those sessions. Um, Angie, thank you for joining us again here today. Uh, Angie's our director of in-practice uh, consulting services, specifically in the area of service delivery. So uh, the teams of consultants that we have working at the point of care uh, ultimately are, are part of Angie's organization. Uh, so Angie, thanks, thanks again for joining us. Um, and then our special guest is Matt Solid. Uh, Matt is a uh, licensed clinical social worker and psychotherapist uh, working with the Lansing Institute of Behavioral Medicine in Lansing, Michigan, uh, not far from the banks of the Red Cedar for those of you who are Big Ten fans or Michigan State people uh, like myself. Um, anyway, Matt brings years of experience counseling a, a wide range of, of age groups, uh, working specifically with those in their 20s and 30s, assisting with uh, major life transitions. Uh, full disclosure, uh, as, as our work, Medical Advantage's work in the behavioral health area continues to grow, we've actually engaged Matt as an advisor, and uh, Matt is working closely with Angie and her team as we're supporting our, our behavioral health clients. So Matt, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, let me do a quick introduction or overview of Medical Advantage for those of you who are, are new. We are part of the doctor's company. We, we fit under the umbrella of the TDC group. Uh, the doctor's company is the largest physician-owned med-mal insurer in the country with roughly 100,000 physicians insured nationwide, over $6 billion in, in assets. The TDC group consists of different business units. We are the subsidiary, the only subsidiary, not in the professional liability space, um, but rather we're, we're providing a range of consulting and training services uh, typically done right at the point of care. Uh, if we look at the next slide, Josh, we, we really lump these into two buckets. We'll be focusing more, I think, on the right-hand side around EHR uh, services, ultimately led by, by Angie's team. Um, but we'll be talking about these as we go, uh, in specifically in, in the context of behavioral health uh, practices. Okay, so with that, um, Josh, why don't we take down the slides and, and let's, let's just talk. Um, but before we get into our, our content, let, let's hear a little bit more from, from Matt and Angie directly. Matt, I guess starting with you, can, can you give us a little bit more about your background uh, as well as the work you do at the Lansing Institute? Sure. Um, I've, I've been in practice in social work and psychotherapy now for about 11 years. I got my start in Washington, D.C., my hometown, and doing work in ambulatory inpatient psych. So I started in the mental hospitals, and, and that's where I began before coming out and branching to private practice when I moved to Michigan about uh, eight years ago now. 
And uh, since then, I focused, uh, as you mentioned, primarily on life transitions and you know the 20, 30 year old range, but I do see uh, a broad group of, of ages as well. Um, very few pediatrics, but you know some older adults and geriatrics as well. You know, make sure you have a good, uh, uh, solid feel for what the community's needs are, and 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 seeing a broad group of people has helped me to do that. I've also done quite a bit of work in uh, traumatic brain injury um, in the past as well. So I've been very fortunate to be able to uh, engage with um, uh, a wonderful and diverse population. Um, I've been now with the Lansing Institute of Behavioral Medicine for about. Uh, Geez, six years now, um, and have been enjoying working with them since we're doing quite well uh, with our uh, medium large practice, 40 practitioners. So there's 40 clinicians that work with us, yeah. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, otherwise, you know, my uh, connections, I, I have good relationships with other providers. I do work with Sparrow and training residents to help them to understand and identify some of the uh, psycho-emotional challenges that a physician or a resident might see as they uh, go through their rounds and experience different personality types and, and challenges. Uh, and I've been doing the work with uh, Sparrow and, and partnering with, with um, their physical medicine and, and rehab residents now for about five years. Okay, very good. And for those of you, um, Sparrow is a local hospital system, healthcare system in the, in the Lansing area. Great. Thank you, Matt. So Angie, maybe same for you. Can you talk a little bit about your role in a, in a bit more detail or the role of your team and sure. um, you know, what you see with, with, with respect to demand or need for, for behavioral health? Yep, thanks Bill. So um, like Bill said, I'm the director of our EHR services and our in-practice services, which is really um, working within the practice, whether it's operationally, um, helping organizations roll up into one TIN, or um, helping PE companies consolidate practices under one group. Um, currently, we are working in practices to implement and optimize the EHR. We're also doing workflow, um, workflow re-optimization or redesign, as some will call it. But the majority of our work is done in medium to large practices or organizations and helping them operationally. So the EHR really is the heart of the practice, whether it's behavioral health or just traditional medicine, um, it, it is the, the heart of the practice. So lately what we've seen is that, especially after COVID, as everybody's aware, a lot of need for mental health support and a lot of companies like private equity companies are, are purchasing and acquiring um, and merging behavioral health organizations to you know serve in, in many different capacities. So we do help them, you know, put, get onto one platform and standardize their operations. Okay, very good. So with that, why don't why don't we start to dive in, um, Matt? I'd I'd love to hear. So just to build upon what Angie just just mentioned, COVID has a major impact on. Uh, behavioral health uh, services from from any number of different uh, you know patient populations um, and really by any measure uh, we, we were looking at this a little bit in terms of the increase in men seeking help or the increase in um, you know alcohol issues or substance abuse depression anxiety you know that that's a whole track um, uh, also the use of virtual visits uh, telehealth technology um, you know all, all, all these things that that have gone on I, I'd love to hear your perspective you know what has the last year or 18 months been like for you and, and your practice uh, you're absolutely unprecedented, and and you know in the in the in the beginning we sort of got this news of of you know here's what's coming down the pipeline, and it became a scramble. And and even in the beginning we we didn't know what platforms we could use for video or audio or how we were going to do that. And people are wondering, can we use even you know FaceTime and 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 these other programs? And it took us you know although a, a relatively short period of time, but we had to find out on our own what was going to be encrypted, what was going to be HIPAA protected. How are we going to utilize these programs? How are we going to get them to every provider? How are we going to train the providers quickly enough on this system to be able to use it when we had sometimes a day's notice that we're shutting down the office or we're, we're doing it this way? So 
even from the beginning, it was almost the Wild West when it came to how to use telehealth and how we were going to actually access it and do so in a way that was going to um, respect privacy and and protect our our patient base, uh, which was absolutely critical to us. Um, I mean, the last 18 months as a whole, it, it has been, and, and, you know, from what I could see, what I could imagine is the, one of the biggest mental health crises in this nation's history. And, and I, I can't, looking back, imagine anything that has affected this broad of a group uh, of people, it, it's virtually everybody in this country, uh, the way that it has, uh, at least since 1918, when, 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 when the Spanish influenza pandemic occurred. Um, so we had to almost relearn in a lot of ways, how am I reading a patient or client? How am I doing that? You know, even to the point where you don't realize how important it is when you see somebody doing the, the, the leg shake in a session, you know, and they're nervous, can't, can't see the legs, can't see anything below here frequently. So we had to learn how to um, read everybody's eyes profoundly, how to make sure we are focusing on what the body language looks like when we're only getting a third of the body. Um, how we are, um, I, mean, I would gain a lot from somebody just walking into my office, um, seeing how they walk, were they in a hurry to get into there to disclose something, were they uh, feeling off, were they, was there, even was their gait off, was something you know, not quite there in their posture. And we had to look at many different ways that we're able to access that. And then you know, that brought out, how do we communicate what we're learning with each other if we're not in the office together? How are we communicating our own challenges if we're not necessarily together? And it became, in a lot of ways, especially in the beginning from a clinical standpoint, quite isolating. And I think that changes in technology are, are coming along that are allowing us to feel less isolated with this kind of a system. Uh, and that's been very important as well. Um, I have seen more men engaging in therapy. I have seen uh, more people engaging in therapy. I have seen more people have access to it. I saw my no-show rates drop significantly because people can always just show up. I was able to, interestingly enough, gain an idea of how do people live? What is it, what is it, you know, if I'm seeing somebody that's in college and I can see their laundry everywhere, are they disorganized? Are they paying attention? Are they, you know, what is their desk? I can see what their desk looks like. You know, and, and, and that became actually in itself a tool that I would not have had without, without this. So there were some, in some ways, you know, the, the telehealth and bringing you into somebody's uh, place of living was actually quite helpful. So we did gain some advantages from it in that respect. Um, we saw substance abuse skyrocket. We saw people uh, able to justify their, their drinking or substance use because I'm not driving. Um, and that, you know, that, that became in itself a challenge. So we're also doing substance abuse treatment over the, the, the Zoom um, and or over um, a, a, a telehealth platform. So we, we really saw that happen quite a bit. Um, and we saw, um, a lot of positive connection with people in outlying areas that we wouldn't normally have been able to see. I was able to see people from Lansing and Ann Arbor. I was able to see people in Grand Rapids without any issue. Uh, theoretically, the underserved areas, say the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, which is quite sparsely populated, I would be able to uh, give access to somebody, uh, psychotherapy, and even the psychotherapist of their choice. Um, uh, whereas before, they may have had to have driven 50, 60 miles just to access a clinician for a, an hour session once a week, which, which in itself is, is, is tremendously inhibited. Um, or small towns where there might not be a therapist for miles, so where we were able to provide mental health care for those people and to do so in a way that was uh, quite meaningful uh, and, and, and really did give people what they, what they desperately needed from the therapy. Um, so we, we saw quite a bit, quite a bit shift with, with this technology. Thank you. I, I can only imagine. Uh, but, you know, Angie, just to build on that, if, if we look at behavioral health from a business perspective, I think many of the things that Matt just hit on uh, cause or, or accelerate the, the M&A activity, the consolidation activity, the, the interest from the private equity community. Um, th this was one, you know, so many of our clients for a period of time were shut down. You know, those, those clinicians or providers, especially uh, specialties that are maybe, you know, non-essential um, or, or elective procedures, you know, many were shut down and, and then just starting to come back now. 
whereas behavioral health, as, as Matt is saying, really saw, saw an increase. Um, so with that, we see a lot of money flowing into the space and it, it drives a lot of activity. So I, I'd be, be very interested in your perspective on just the increase in demand and the kinds of requests we're seeing today versus the same thing, you know, 18 months ago, if you could talk to that. Right. I, and I, I'm going back to what Matt said, where he's able to reach people in rural areas. I think that's so important because, you know, we are starting to see um, that stigma of mental needing, you know, mental health help kind of go away. And it, it was starting to before COVID. And I think people during the pandemic, when they were lonely and they couldn't see their family, they couldn't see their friends, um, they couldn't go anywhere. I think that they started to realize like, you know, hey, I do need somebody to talk to. So the technology is so important in the, the to be able to rely on the technology. So like Matt said, we had to hurry up. What are we gonna use FaceTime? You know, what is it that we need to in order to see our patients not everybody has a webcam not everybody has access to broadband internet but most people have access to a cell phone and they're able to video conference with their providers so i think it's so important that um, reaching those areas uh, where people maybe didn't have access or you know had to drive an hour just to get an access to um, a mental health provider but with that said um what we're starting to see with mergers and acquisitions is there the need not only in rural areas but in maybe any community so we used to really focus on communities that maybe were underserved and in bringing you know addiction specialists to them um whether it's driving around in a in a van literally uh seeing these patients on the streets or um you know trying to use telehealth but you couldn't find your patients maybe they were homeless now you're seeing you know, people from all sorts of walks of life need this type of care. You're seeing payers starting to open up and pay for the care. Whereas in the past, you, know, you had a very limited amount of visits, you had to pay cash. And so um, with all that, the, the private equity companies are starting to see the value um, from a business perspective. And the patients are starting to see the value in the care. So consolidating, large organizations and, and offering you know services for for people of all ages offering telehealth offering services to people who maybe aren't in your zip code so thinking outside the box a lot of the pe companies are, are buying up organizations in various states so they're starting to ask can my can my page can my um clinics in florida see patients in georgia or can you know the clinics in georgia see patients in new york and as we all know, the telehealth um, boom has really brought into light, hey, I can see my patients or other patients, new patients in any area, um, but there, does, there is some, some strings attached to that, you know, when it comes to um, especially cross-state, right, licensure. However, it's starting to, um, the payers are starting to recognize that whether it's behavioral health or, you know, um, any other type of health care that this, that telehealth and consolidation is where it's going. Hospitals used to be, were the ones buying out practices. It's not like that anymore. It's private equity companies or uh, larger organizations themselves, you know, purchasing and consolidating. And where we come in is standardizing because you, you have six, seven practices being acquired at once and they all are on six or seven different EHRs and they have different, you know, policies and procedures. So, consolidating all that so it makes sense from a financial perspective and from an operational perspective um, is what we're mainly focused on. And with that in mind, you know, with doing that and then having it in mind that these providers want to see patients outside of their traditional areas. Very good, very good. So I'd like to talk about a, a, an actual customer example in, in just a minute, but maybe before we get there, um, Matt, if, if you could give us a, a quick refresher on uh, the way we document a therapy visit is, is different, uh, different kind of sets of notes mm -hmm. than a traditional, you know, primary care. Um, and that, I think, has implications for the, the, the documentation and, and how we're managing the data. So can you give us a quick uh, summary of that? 
Sure. So when it comes to documentation for a, a therapist, in this case, this is going to come a little bit different than medically. Of course, with an individual, you have your rights to your medical chart always. And, and um, when it comes to behavioral health and psychotherapy, slightly different. So we run into an issue where the note itself can actually do harm to the person. So we have to have much more robust protections, not only for those notes, but also to uh, ensure that um, there's uh, a, a, st a strong sense of continuity in how we are releasing when it is appropriate, why we are, and also how we protect things like what we would call private psychotherapy notes, which have a much stronger level of protection than even the regular notes. We have a note and a subnote, where the subnote might be much more opinionated, much more of a reminder, and those ones are the ones that you might think of as a therapist scribbling down in their notebook as opposed to the one that they might keep in the medical record and uh, eventually submit for billing. So we have to maintain an extraordinarily high level of privacy with those to protect people because of that real risk. So for us, anytime somebody calls to request their notes from a therapist, the therapist has to make a decision read through every one of the notes go is this going to cause an issue is this person going to read this and say my goodness this is what the therapist thinks of me oh oh my and potentially act out or end the therapy and no longer receive the help that they were actually potentially benefiting from very good very good so then um angie back to you as, as we see the consolidation happening, and, and you hit on this just a second ago, um, whether it's, it's the hospital system who's acquiring neighboring practices or private equity uh, firms, it, it's all about standardization, right? Within a big practice, you know, perhaps like, like uh, Matt's or as we bring together multiple uh, locations. So, you know, part of that, it, it, it's you know people process it's everything but it, especially right. the the technology so can you talk to that a little bit yeah so the technology is so important from from so many perspectives but especially in behavioral health is the security within the clinic you know who has access to what um, do we want you know the the receptionist seeing all of the progress notes or or so on so security uh, and the capabilities in an EHR to, you know, maybe silo certain areas of the clinic is so important. And I know we're going to talk about our client in just a minute, but when we were vetting new EHR vendors for them, that was on their top, you know, top five things. We need to make sure that we are able to set this up where, you know, we can secure patients' records. Um, and so I think it's, I think that's so important, but also looking at um, growth, right? So some EHRs might be perfect for a practice of 30 physicians, 30 providers, but what about a practice or an organization that has 100 or 200 and they're multi-specialty? So sometimes you'll have internal medicine, family medicine, peds with, and then they'll have um, therapists within their, within their organization. So you need a system that's going to accommodate both. And oftentimes it falls short when it comes to the the mental health side of it. So um, I think a lot of the, the EHR vendors are starting to see the importance of it. But uh, again, there are so, there are factors involved, and, and most importantly, is security, is securing those records so the patients feel confident that what they're you know talking about with their therapist isn't spread across the the practice or organization or or so on. Very good. Very good. Okay. So why don't we, there's nothing like an actual example, just, just to make it real. So why don't, why don't we do that? Um, and, and I know we, we've got a, an idea in mind. So Angie, if you could start to take us through sort of the, you know, before, during, and after how we were approached and, um, you know, that, that whole story. Sure. So a large uh, behavioral health organization um, that's backed by private equity, actually Googled us, Googled um, services that they needed and found us. And what was happening in their organization is they had outgrown their EHR. In addition to that, they, when they're consolidating these practices and acquiring practices, operations is, is different the way each 
organization runs their practice, whether it's a you know two provider practice or 100 providers. So they needed operational um, advice and, and consulting, and they also needed uh, a, a company to help them that's very familiar with EHR to help them find an EHR that fits their needs from the therapist perspective, from billing, uh, like I said earlier, security. So we actually brought Matt in. That's when we found Matt and said, we need an advisor because we're looking at it from a technology standpoint. We're looking at it from operations, which is all great, but really the patient is the center of all this. And we need to focus on how can the therapist see their patient, care for their patient, have all the information they need to make good decisions. Um, and what does that, what does that mean? What information do they need? So what's important to the therapist? We already knew it was important to the to the investors, we already knew it was important to the billing it, folks. We knew what an EHR could do, the capabilities. So vetting vendors was, was fine, but we needed to know what does the therapist need from this, this EHR. And so Matt came in, he said on, on a lot of um, demos from various vendors, we probably had more demos than we ever want to see again. But the point is we wanted the best software for this organization because they do see so many different you know types of patients from different walks of life and whether they're in a mobile unit or in a practice or in a school they need a, a reliable software so um they came to us and they said help us with this help us with operations help us with it and bring it all together so all of our clinics run you know, pretty much the same way. And, and they, they all have the same expectations and, and so on. So that's what we, um, we've been doing. Great. So Matt, your, your perspective on this from more the, you know, clinician side of things. Um, so when it comes to the use of the EMRs for us, <clears throat> it's all about accessibility, usability. It's all about communication with them. How am I able to see other people's notes? How am I able to generate my own? How am I able to use this as both a way of um, effectively remembering what's going on from session to session, but also using it as a tool to be able to let other clinicians that might see that person, psychiatry, nurse practitioners, know what I'm working on, where I'm going with it, where I'm thinking, what the trends are. How do we track trends? How do we track um, scores from um, uh, self-assays and things like that? And, 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 and really utilizing an EMR to be able to do that is, it, it's gonna work for each sort of clinician or clinical group standpoint is is, is is of the utmost importance to be able to make that flow to make it make it go well very good so angie this is still ongoing right or can you give us an update on where, where we're at with this project so we um this is ongoing yes we have another uh actual client that we just started the same similar type of project with but, but with this client you know, we've identified the EHR, we're going to help them implement it, we're going to support them. Um, we are working on, uh, you know, IT and practice marketing um, parts of their practice. So, you know, their EHR is one probably most important part, but there are other areas that they need help with and getting the word out to the community to say, hey, we have these services, these offerings available to you, whether it's through social media or their website, um, so helping them with that, and then again, writing policies and procedures, helping them, they're actually going through a CARF accreditation right now, we're helping them with that accreditation, writing all their policies and procedures, which is, is not easy for an organization uh, when everybody is so busy working, doing their day to day, it, it's nice for them to have, you know, consultants come in and say, I'll take that off your plate and do it and do it really well. So um, the relationship has really developed and it's been a great experience. Um, we're excited to see how their new EHR works for them. Um, we're pretty confident that they're going to grow quickly and this, this system will work well for them. And the EHR has become even more critical as a point of community, again, a point of communication for us. Um, I might even, even though I'm in a large group, I might not see a psychiatrist that I need to talk to about a particular patient uh, for two days. And that psychiatrist could have the office next to mine just because of how hard we work, the hours, the way that it works between sessions. So a lot of times the, the EMR becomes the sole point of communication about clinical challenges and you're effectively passing notes through it. And, and that, that 
uh, ability to have that kind of standardized and utilized communication becomes uh, something that protects patients and, and helps them to receive better and more holistic and, and, and well-structured treatment. Fantastic. All right. Excellent. Uh, let's take, we've had a couple questions come in, so let's, uh, let's take some questions. And for those of you who haven't, please feel free to submit a question. If we don't get to them all, I, I, I promise we'll, we'll follow up after the fact. Uh, this first one is amazing. Um, it relates to the Cures Act. Can, can Matt give his perspective on the Cures Act as it relates to behavioral health? We've, we've, we've been talking about this, um, Angie, more in general. Like I think we've done two webinars on EHR open notes just in the last, I don't know, 45 days. Uh, so this is very timely. Um, before we get to Matt, Angie, can you just do a quick hit on what does this mean uh, for, for a practice? And then we can get Matt's perspective. So the CARES Act, and, and more, most importantly, I think what this person is referring to is open notes, yeah. where you, the, the organizations, healthcare organizations, hospitals, medical practices have to give pretty much full access to the patient's medical record, um, whether it be via the EHR, printing the entire record, whatever it is, they have to give them access to that uh, record. But with behavioral health, it's a little different because there are certain aspects of the record, like Matt mentioned earlier, that maybe wouldn't benefit the patient um, to know. So, um, especially when it comes to, you know, their treatment. So it is a sticky situation. And I, I think that the behavioral health um, field has a, a lot of uh, navigating to do through that. And I'm sure rules will change. but. Yeah, so, so open notes is really giving patients full access to their medical records. So Matt, what's your take on that? You know, it's, it's interesting, we all sit here thinking like, you know, in, in looking at one's own medical records, you might not like what you find. And, and more so with the behavioral health than any others, most people aren't gonna go to their cardiologist and become offended because they said that they were tachycardic. They, they, they know, and but but people are are much more likely to take offense at a diagnosis to go. Wait a second, I'm not bipolar. Or I'm not a narcissist, or I'm not a this or that. So then, what we found was that um, psychiatrists, particularly that 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 I was working with, were writing very broad notes, and I, it was even difficult for me as a clinician frequently to be able to really know what was going on without then having to verbally sideline that that uh, psychiatrist and go, hey, what are, you, what, are you, what are you really thinking here? Um, because that, the note itself was, is being written in such a way to more protect the patient from themselves in a way. And, and that, in, in a sense, really um, made, it, made it almost more difficult to, to convey information between clinicians. Um, I do not think that this is nearly as much of a problem in any of the other Feels, but with behavioral health, it becomes particularly difficult just because what we might observe in somebody and though that sort of symptom cluster may create a perfect storm, which it does, of um, frustration or offense or even, you know, letting, uh, finding other clinicians because they don't like what they've been diagnosed with because they um, sort of subjectively disagree with it. Understood. Understood. It'll uh, be interesting to keep an eye on the, the, this whole area. Um, sure. Next question relates to business growth or expansion for behavioral health practice. Uh, Matt, Matt, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, Angie was just mentioning practice marketing opportunities and in, in, from your own practice, could, could you talk about some of the things that you guys are up to with respect to growth and expansion. Absolutely, you know, and as a practice, we, we always want to look to how we can expand, how we can uh, serve more uh, uh, people in the community. And even though we are uh, considered a fairly large practice, we have also a, a commensurately sized waiting list for people to be seen. And, you know, with things like um, uh, telehealth, we're able to bring on more clinicians that are able to see more people and not necessarily have to be dependent upon office space to do so, um, but also, we are working on programs um, just to just to grow in general um, 
uh, fellowships, working with uh, universities uh, throughout the state to be able to bring in newly graduated MSW students and, and uh, help them with their supervision, licensing, grow them, grow them into practice styles, train them, and expand through collaboration with universities, collaboration with professional groups. Uh, the growth is, is critical. We cannot bring on enough clinicians. We just, we can't, we, we always will need more and always will want more. The, the appetite for new clinicians for a practice like ours never ends. Um, so not only are there great opportunities in that, but there's always that need and ability to grow within them. So wonderful opportunity there. And I think, um, Bill, sorry to interrupt, but like Matt said, they can't, there's such a demand, they can't bring in, you know, 50 more therapists, there isn't any space, but with telehealth, you know, getting the word out to the community, whether it's with social media, especially for younger people, um, different platforms to say, hey, if you need to talk to somebody, you don't have to go in, you can talk to them, you know, on your cell phone or, you know, via video visit. Um, I think that's so important is, is getting the word out and through practice marketing to, you know, especially math area students um, that have been really affected by the last year. So um, it's a great advantage when, when you can have that um, kind of therapist or help at the, at, on your phone at any time, not any time, Matt, <laughs> not in the middle of the night, but maybe. But having that, that word out, you know, through, through practice marketing to say on whatever social media platform that college students are using now, advertising that, hey, at, at the click of a button, you can have somebody to talk to. Absolutely. It really helped us with activation. One of the biggest challenges in bringing in um, new patients to a place is just this idea of activation. The person knows that they need the help. They need to go online. They need to find the clinic. They need to set up the appointment. They need to get up that day, go in, feel that sense potentially is, is going into a first appointment of what is this going to be, the nervousness and the ability for the person to do that in the home environment. Um, the ability for them to activate, to take that step in, in a comfortable environment became um so possible that that our amount of people that we saw i think just based on that caused enormous growth if people are able to make the appointment get to the appointment do the appointment participate in the appointment rather than making the appointment and then kind of um dropping out at the last minute or panicking or going oh, oh my goodness this is this is too much for me or, or what's this going to be it really reduced a lot of the anxiety just working with with folks Okay, very good. Um, let's start to wrap up here. Josh, if you could put the slides back up. I wanted to share a little information or, or where you can go for, for more, more information. Um, my, myself, Angie's uh, contact information is, is on the slide here. We'd be happy to get you in touch with Matt if, uh, if, if needed. Uh, we do a lot of sessions like this. I think we'll do more in the behavioral health area as we go along. We tend to promote these in our social media channel, so please uh, like, follow us here. I'd, I'd also give a quick commercial for the Medical Advantage podcast, which we uh, launched just earlier this year. A lot of the same content just available in, in podcast form. So check us out wherever you get your podcasts. We've got a bunch of information available also on our website, um, blog articles, uh, recorded, you know, past webinars that are, that are recorded and available on demand. Um, please, please uh, take a look. So uh, one, one final point here as, as we start to sign off, as, as soon as uh, we, we end today, you'll see a survey that comes up on your screen. If you could please just take a minute, answer a couple questions, give us some feedback. We, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, and with that, I guess, I guess we're set. So uh, Angie, Matt, thank you very much uh, for your time today. I thought this was a, a great session. Thanks for your, your insights. Um, and for you, our audience, thank you for joining us. We certainly hope uh, you, you found this session useful. For those of you in the scenario that Angie and Matt described, just know help is available. Uh, we'd be more than happy to talk to you. Um, uh, so anyway, thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you again at a, a another session in the future. Um, please enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everyone.